Hello, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Mario DeSanto, and today we're going to emulate a 1950s recording. The recording studio in the 1950s looked a lot different than a modern recording studio. This was an era dominated by tape, tubes, and talent. Compared to the many luxuries today, there were many limitations as well back then. Today we're going to hone in on these limitations in order to try to replicate a 1950s sound. Remember, limitations are good. They spur creativity and push you to try to extract every single drop of juice out of what you got. I'm going to go through some of these limitations in detail, and then at the end of this video, I'm going to implement all these and put it all together, and we're going to try to record a little song here and see if we can properly emulate a 1950s recording. Let's begin with today's first restriction, track quantity. Multi-track recording became popular in the 1950s when musical pioneer Les Paul popularized its use. Even then, most recording studios still had a very limited number of tracks, with most places usually having a two-track machine. Sometimes you'd see a three-track machine and really depended on what studio you were in. Because of this restraint, the band was almost always recorded live in the room. Keep in mind throughout this whole lesson that I'm greatly generalizing the recording process of the 1950s depending on where you were, who you were working with, you know, what, what time in the 1950s. It could be changed drastically, but you'll get the point. In this type of ensemble situation, room mics were extremely important in getting that signature sound. There were some close mics used, uh, for example, like on a guitar um, cabinet or for the main vocalist if they're singling, singing live. It, it really depends. And, um, you know, those close mics are really more for clarity and detail, whereas the room mic is really where the mojo is coming from. A lot of mixing was also done in the room space as well before it even got to the mixing board, right? So if the guitar needed to be a little higher in the mix, you know, the, the recording engineer would move the guitar amp closer to the room mic. If the drums were a little too loud, the room mic would be backed away from the drums. Everything's going to be situated around that main central room mic. Now, as I mentioned earlier, Sometimes close mics were used. Now these close mics, uh, being in this live room, is going to have a lot of bleed from other instrumentation, which is another part of the mojo that it comes from, you know, a live room recording. So this is another important aspect to, to consider. Fortunately for us today, it's just me in this recording studio, so I'm going to have to kind of do a mock live room setup. But I'm going to be setting up my room as if I had multiple people to help me and re you know, record this song. So I'm gonna have the guitar over there. I'm gonna have the bass over there. I'm gonna have the drums over there. I'm gonna use one single ribbon mic as my room mic to capture the main sound from all three of these instruments. I'm gonna put a close mic on the guitar amp as well because it's kind of like the main driving force of this song. Um, I would usually always put in a close mic on the bass drum, but today I'm feeling a little experimental and I want to see what kind of sound I could get from just uh, the, room, the room mic. So we'll see what happens. And then later on, once I record these three instruments, I am going to overdub the vocals and some tambourine as well. Next constraint on the list is microphone selection. Now, I kind of have a hard time calling this a limitation because the microphones of this era are still incredibly sought after and they're not bound, bad sounding by any means. Uh, that being said, there are a couple things to consider when trying to do a 1950s recording. Ribbon mics were the most commonly type of microphone used. Uh, as such, I will be using a ribbon mic as the room mic to capture the three main instruments. Uh, it's not a vintage ribbon mic, it is a modern ribbon mic, but it's the best I could do today. Now for the close mic on the guitar amp, I'm going to be using a dynamic microphone, which were also used in the time. And this is going to be an Electra Voice 664, also known as the Buckingham Hammer, and this was a common microphone used at the time. Now, something to consider when recording with ribbon mics is they naturally have a high-end roll-off 
And in conjunction with recording on tape, which also has a high end roll off, you're gonna need to compensate with uh, boosting the high end when you're mixing. Um, you know, usually this is, especially at the time, would be done before the sound ever hit the tape. So when I record these instruments, I'm gonna be significantly boosting the high end for this re for this reason. Now, when you listen to some less polished 1950s recording or, you know, 1940s, 1930s, any music you're listening to of, the, of that earlier era, you could hear that high-end roll-off. And in some cases, it's very obvious. Um, so when I record my song today, I'm still kind of having trouble uh, when recording on tape with getting that high-end that you're, we're used to when listening to a modern recording. So just kind of keep that in mind when we're listening back. Moving on to the next topic, outboard equipment. <laughs> Now, the outboard equipment at the time was very limited, and in most cases, the mixing consoles were custom-made in-house to whatever recording studio you were in, so there were not many very luxuries, and nothing was really standardized yet. Preamps at the time were all tube-based, so as a result, I will be using a tube preamp, the MP5.66. Now, depending on who or where you get your information from, the use of compression at the time seems to vary wildly. Um, for example, the Brits on the other side of the pond tend to be more heavy-handed with their compression, while, you know, like Motown, whenever I listen to Motown, tends to be less compressed. You know, once again, it it's so depends on the recording engineer and, you know, the, the musical selection that's being recorded that, it, it you know, it's hard to give... Um, uh, you know, one singular answer for the amount of compression you should be using and how to utilize it. One thing to keep in mind is that when you're recording in a live room like this, the actual air and space between instruments and the microphone acts as a natural compressor. When you close, close mic an instrument, you're going to be getting a lot more peaks, a lot more clarity, a lot more in-your-faceness, whereas when you're listening to something from a room mic, the sound's going to be more even. The air is going to act as a cushion, and that's kind of act as it's going to act as a compressor of its own. So this is something to consider when you're using a room mic in this situation. You might not have to be as heavy-handed. As far as outboard effects go, there's really only three I could think of off the top of my head that were popularly used. The first being tremolo on a guitar amp, and um, you know sometimes vocals are ran through that. Like think of uh, what's the name of the song? Crimson and Clover. Crimson and Clover, you know, like that's a great example of vocals being run through a guitar amp, at least I think it was. Um, second effect being tape delay. Now, you could get like a really cool slapback delay using a tape machine. Like you often hear this on some like rockabilly records. And the third uh, being the most widely used was reverb. And at the time, you know, these recording studios were probably using plate reverbs or uh, uh, cham uh, reverb chambers that were basically just big rooms where sound was you know, put onto a speaker and record it onto a far microphone. But today, given my limitations in this recording studio, I'm just going to be using a cheap spring reverb that I had. Uh, I'm not going to use any tape delay on this song just because it doesn't really seem to fit the, uh, you know, the vibe of the song. Um, there's going to be some tremolo on my guitar amp as well. The next topic of discussion is editing. <laughs> Now, I know in today's digital computer-based world, I mean, the amount of edits that are on a pop song today is probably astronomical. I mean, it's crazy. Back then, you were really only relegated to two things. You either were splicing sections of tape together to combine different takes, or you were overdubbing. Now, today, we, there's no really need for splicing any tape for this song selection, um, but I will be overdubbing the vocals and the tambourine, as I previously stated. Now, the amount of overdubs, of course, is going to vary widely from situation to situation, you know, depending on the artist, the, the budget of the project, the recording engineer. There's many variables that you need to consider. Uh, you know, a surprising amount of editing can be done just through overdubbing and bouncing tracks. Now, this isn't really the 1950s, but if you fast forward to the 1960s, this is, this is where, uh, you know, overdubbing and bouncing tracks became like very experimental. Like think of Sgt. Pepper, uh, you know, I was recorded on a four track machine. And you know, there, there's 
an incredible amount of different instrumentation going on and different edits and splice points and stuff like that. So it really depends on the situation. So one important aspect of editing in a live room situation like this, if you're all recording onto one singular tape track, all of your EQing relative volume or gain and compression for any close mics, anything like this needs to be done before it ever hits tape. Because now if you're having multiple instruments put onto this track on the tape, you can't edit any individual instrument. Any individual instrument that you try to EQ or compress is going to affect the whole track, whatever is on that track. So today, I'm going to try to emulate this as best as possible. Um, I'm not going to be really be able to do that because it's only me in the studio and I can't play three separate instruments at one time. So, you know, I'm going to try my best to pre-EQ everything and not touch anything later. I will definitely have to, you know, move around the, the volume of each track just because, you know, like I said, I can't play three instruments at once, so I can't change the volume when I'm recording. So, you know, it's a little not period correct, but it's the best I could do given my own limitations. Last thing we're going to talk about, but it's probably the most important aspect in all this, is the talent in the room. Now, I'm not saying that people of today have any less talent than people in the 1950s. That's not what I'm saying at all. What I am saying is that in the 1950s, there weren't really amateurs in the recording studio. If you were in the recording studio, you were a true and true professional. I mean, you had to be. You didn't have the choice of doing unlimited takes. You couldn't make a mistake if you're recording in a live ensemble. I mean, the whole band would have to start over, right? I mean, you had to be on top of your game. Fast forward to a time like today when people have the luxury of recording in their bedroom and, you know, they could do unlimited takes and limited overdubbing, unlimited, edit uh, unlimited editing, you know, copy and pasting. I mean, you know, uh, you're able to get away with a lot less musicianship today. Um, you know, it's not, once again, that's not a knock against musicians of today. That's just the nature of recording today. Expanding further, the musicians recording in the recording studio were usually either all touring musicians or paid session musicians. Now, these people were complete masters of their instruments. They know how to make every sound possible out of their instrument. They know how to control their dynamics. They know how to control their tone. EQing and compression was needed a lot less because of this. You know, a lot can be done before the sound even hits the microphone, and that all has to do with the player playing the instrument. In addition, the playing style of the time was also wildly different. Now, this was due to a, a number of factors, and uh, probably the easiest example I could explain this with is with the drums. Now, in the modern-day recording studio, a drum's in an isolation booth, usually, and the drummer's wailing away on a rock recording. I mean, that snare drum's being pounded. The, the toms are being smashed, cymbals crashed, as loud as you possibly can. I mean, that's the modern rock sound, that aggressive sound. Now, go back to the 1950s when everything's being recorded in a live room. A drummer couldn't do that. If a drummer did that, it would be overpowering all the other instrumentation in the room. The drummer had to be subtle. He had to use dynamics to make everything gel well and sit in the pocket. It couldn't be fixed later on. It had to be fixed in the moment in the live room. So, you know, for example, when I'm recording this song today, I'm going to play softer. I'm going to be playing traditional grip, so I'm not just cranking down on that snare drum. This same idea can be applied to any of the other instruments as well. Now keep in mind with all this talk of being masters of your instrument and being true professionals in a recording studio, it's really important to note that perfection was never a necessity during this era, or really de the decades after as well. In the, in the tape world, there's really no such thing as perfect. There's always going to be these small mistakes, you know, mistakes is a subjective term here because a lot of these mistakes you would never notice unless you were really looking for them. You know, a great example of this, once again, not the 1950s, but the Beatles, there's a whole website dedicated to every single song they've recorded that has all the mistakes in that song. Now, I'll put a link somewhere in the description so you could browse that and see what I mean. I mean, 
you know, you listen to any one of these Beatles songs and you think, oh, they, this is perfect. They couldn't have made it any better. And you look at the list of the number of mistakes on there, and you know there, there's ten mistakes on the track. But you would never notice them. I mean, it's to me, it's what makes a song organic and natural and human. It doesn't sound like some computer-generated garbage, in my opinion. With all, with all that being said, try to embrace this organicness, this naturalness. Don't go to your goddamn quantization or your auto-tune because goddamn mother. Anyway. Now that we have a basic understanding of some of the basic characteristics of a 1950s recording, let's take all the things we just learned and try to implement them in a song. So I'm going to play a small excerpt from the song um, that I recorded, and we'll talk about it afterwards. Okay, so that was a small excerpt. If you want to hear more, I'll put a link somewhere in the description for you to hear. Some um, comments on that. Uh, you know, I, I wasn't really happy with some things. Uh, you know, a close mic on the snare drum probably would have benefited the, drown, uh, the drum sound a lot. You know, to me, like, the snare was just so thin without a close mic on it. Same thing can be said for the bass. Um, you know, I was really only using the ribbon uh, room mic for the bass and to me it just really gets lost in the mix so you know it's just something to consider uh, you know the vocals really wasn't happy with and I think that was more to do with my performance than anything and didn't really have anything to do with the setup um, although I think a dynamic microphone would have helped my voice a little bit there um, other than that, though, I mean, I don't know. I, I would like you guys to let me know if you think it sounds like a 1950s recording or not. Uh, you know, I'm too close to it personally to imagine it that way. So, you know, someone else's opinion would be pretty great to hear. That is all for today, you crazy kids. I hope you learned something good. I hope you're eager and you want to record something now. I hope you take some of the lessons that I taught you today and use it in your music. If you do, please send me it. I love to listen to it. And if you have any suggestions for any future videos, please let me know. I'd be more than happy to oblige. And, yeah, I think that's all for today. Thank you for listening. I'll see you guys next time.